want to remind everyone that this is being recorded. Um, so uh, I want to also remind people that um, uh, these are sponsored by um, Cape Cod Five, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, and Martha's Vineyard Savings. And we also want people to know that uh, all the books that uh, are um, are part of this series can be bought at uh, Eight Cousins Bookseller in uh, in Falmouth. So um, want, wanted to uh, let people know about that. Um, I also hope that uh, everybody was able to uh, to navigate. Uh, um, uh, Eventbrite, okay. As I, I told, uh, uh, I told Dr. Norton that she's a little bit of a lab rat. That uh, we haven't done these, these Eventbrite things before, so I hope it, that that worked out okay. Um, so, uh, if if you had if you had some uh, some issues with it, let me know, and I'll try to make sure they I uh, I, I get them fixed for the next one. Um, our speaker tonight is coming to us. Uh, she's even though she's a professor at the at Cornell. Um, she's actually doing this from the vineyard, which is one of the reasons she's doing this topic tonight. Um, Mary Beth Norton is an American historian. She specializes in American colonial history, uh, well known for her work on women's history, Salem witch trials. Um, she went to Harvard. Uh, she went to University of Michigan, and um, I, I said, "But I said, do you want me to say University of Michigan or Tom Brady's school?" She said, "Is it perfectly okay to say it's a, it, it was Tom Brady's school?" So we'll we'll uh, we'll play that silly little game. It, it, she went to Tom Brady's school, um, and, um, and and she also has a new book that came out in uh, in February called 1774: The Long Year of Revolution." And a, a part of the, her talk tonight, because she's coming uh, from the vineyard, is a little bit of a spin-off of that. Would you say, to, um, Dr. Norton? It's a, yeah, absolutely. It, it's a, a, a subset of that as to what was going on in the Cape during the uh, the famous uh, Boston Tea Party. So, uh, part of it, so um, when we get done tonight, we want to make sure that you uh, you go out and buy her book, 1774, the long, the long year of revolution is here we are in 2020, the long year of, uh, of COVID. So uh, without, without further ado, would you welcome Mary Beth Norton? Thanks, Mark. Um, can you set this up so that um, I'm seeing mostly myself on the screen instead of seeing mostly you? <laughs> Not that I don't like seeing you, but just it's easier if I'm looking at myself. If you change it to uh, to gallery view instead of speaker, or, uh, yes, I can, change it to gallery it. view. I'm, I'm seeing I'm seeing you, so it's a so so go up in your upper right corner to to gallery view. I think so I did, I did, and I'm Perfect. now seeing everybody. Okay, and then go to speaker view. That's what I did. Okay, okay. that shows you. Well, as soon as you start talking, it'll show you. <laughs> well, it isn't. I'm talking, and it's not showing me. It's showing somebody else. All right. Well, I'll, how about you start talking and we'll see you. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so, but I actually want to show you the cover of the book. So you'll know what to look for at Eight Cousins Bookstore. This is it. I'm hoping that you can see it on a large screen, not just a tiny thumbnail screen. 1774, The Long Year of Revolution. Um, some of you may be familiar with this little device in the middle of the, of the, um, of the cover, that's um, that's a um, bottle that is at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and it is filled with tea that is said to be tea that was picked up um, that was picked up at the um, uh, on Dorchester on the shore in Dorchester the day after the Boston Tea Party. So that book, which I'm going to talk about today, uh, or I'm going to draw on it. Um, narrates that in detail the events of what I call the Long 1774, which is the period from December 1773, with a small preface in October, which I will explain shortly, to mid-April 1775, to show how colonists who all saw themselves as loyal subjects of King George III and part of the empire in 1773, um, divided into groups during the year 1774. One of those groups persisted in their loyalty to King George, and indeed they began to call themselves loyalists, which is a term that was invented in that year. And there's a second group that began to favor independence in the year 1774. And this is why I think 
1774 is so important that it deserves a book all to itself. Um, I deal with all the colonies that eventually joined the United States, although books on this period, when they exist, which isn't often, um, focus primarily on Massachusetts. So I sort of apologize in advance to everybody about that, but I'm only going to be talking about Massachusetts and the Cape tonight. And the book also focuses intensely on America because most books in this period change their focus at some point and, and flip across the Atlantic and talk about what's going on in Parliament. I wanted to focus on what Americans knew about what was going on. So I don't do that. I have what I call advices from London in every chapter. And that is basically a section of reports from London that were written, either their newspapers or their letters or whatever, that come to the colonies so that the, it's what the Americans knew and only what the Americans knew, not any kind of details about debates in Parliament. Now, rather than try to summarize all or even most of my book, in the short time I have today, I'm going to focus in detail on just one of the incidents I describe, the series of incidents uh, of events that are covered in the first chapter that occurred on Cape Cod because I thought this little known tale would be of particular interest to all of you. I should say that I unearthed this story uh, from a variety of sources, from correspondence and documents in Boston at the Mass Historical Society and at the Boston Athenaeum in London and in San Marino, California at the Huntington Library because some of the papers ended up there and also from newspapers. Now, if you know, I'm speaking virtually from the vineyard today, but in the course of researching this talk and this story, I visited the Cape locations that I'm gonna talk about. That is Eastham, Wellfleet, Provincetown and the site of the shipwreck that's really my subject tonight. And that is the Peaked Hill sandbars, which is now, of course, as you probably all know, in the Cape Cod National Seashore. And I was aided in that visit by some wonderful um, workers, wonderful rangers from the Cape Cod National Seashore from the National Park Service. Now, I'd like to begin tonight by quoting directly from the first page of the first chapter of the book, um, because I start the book with the wreck that I'm going to talk about tonight. Quote, during the stormy early morning hours of December 11th, 1773, a vessel carrying tea and other cargo to Boston wrecked about two miles southeast of Race Point. On board the William were 58 chests of East India Company tea, 55 of which were successfully salvaged. The three damaged chests, each containing about 350 pounds of bohea or black tea, remained on the Cape when the other chests were transported later in the month to the safety of the British headquarters at Castle William, an island in Boston Harbor. Responding to the sudden arrival of approximately 1,000 pounds of tea on their shores, Cape residents worked to earn it, bought and sold it, argued and fought over it, and destroyed some of it. So that's in brief what I'm going to be, that's a kind of a preview of what I'll be talking about tonight in detail. So I do want to tell you the story of that tea on the Cape, but first I need to explain why it was there in the first place and why it was so controversial that it caused trouble throughout pretty much the rest, or at least the first months of 1774. Now the tea story that everybody knows is the story of the Boston Tea Party. I might say that it was not called that until 1826. That was discovered by my colleague at Cornell, Larry Glickman. I did not find that, he did. But more studies than Boston were involved in the tea story. Uh, the East India Company actually sent seven tea ships to North America in 1773. Four were dispatched to Boston, and one each was sent to New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston. Now, I have to give you a brief background. The Tea Act was adopted by Parliament in the spring of 1773. Its purpose was to save the East India Company from bankruptcy. The East India Company was being badly mismanaged. It was a monopoly, so it shouldn't surprise us to learn that it was badly mismanaged. It, was the, it, it held the legal monopoly of all trade with Great Britain and what was known then as the Indies, that is basically China and, um, and what is now Indonesia. But what's at issue here is tea from China. Um, and it, 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 so it 
the East India Company was badly mismanaged, but it also had another major problem. It was confronted by rampant smuggling of all items that people were only supposed to buy legally from the East India Company. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the, um, uh, and in particular, there were textiles and tea were the most um, avidly desired items that came from China to Great Britain and its colonies. Now, the American colonists at the time were known as, quote, prodigious tea drinkers. That's a word I picked up from the contemporary sources. The, it will not surprise you to learn that the members, many members of parliament were stockholders of the East India Company. So they wanted to prevent the East India Company from going bankrupt. Um, the American colonies, their, in their prodigious tree drinking, mostly did not drink East, Company, East, East India Company tea. I'll call it EIC tea, which is shorter. Did not mostly drink EIC tea. They drank WOC tea, which is the other, other uh, sorry, WOC tea, which is the, the Dutch India Company, the Dutch East India Company. And it was smuggled and it was mostly smuggled through the Dutch Caribbean islands, especially the small island in the northeastern Caribbean known as St. Eustatius at the time. Today it's known as Stacia. I suspect no one on this uh, call have ever been there. I've actually gone there twice specifically because I knew it was such an important smuggling haven in the 18th century. It's Quite out, it's not out of the way, it's very well located, and that's why it was such a good place for, for tea smugglers. But it was, however, or it is, not a very good resort island. It doesn't have a white sandy beach, um, it doesn't have a lot of water, um, and so uh, it cannot ever have a resort, um, a, a Caribbean resort kind of, um, of society. Now, the Tea Act was very complex, and it's hard to understand. And in fact, people at the time had trouble understanding it, uh, which is not surprising. But what's important for us is that the key aim of the Tea Act was to lower the tax on, East, on legal East India Company tea in the colonies in order to undercut the smugglers. Because the smugglers, unsurprisingly, were selling their tea for half or two thirds the cost uh, of East India Company tea, which was legal and taxed. And so um, the idea of the Tea Act was to lower the tax that Americans were paying so that they would be more likely to buy East India Company tea. Um, now the Americans' tea key objection was to the symbolism of the tax. They did not want to accept the authority of parliament to tax them. Pretty much all Americans believed in the, what we now know as the, the slogan, no taxation without representation. That did not mean that Americans wanted representation in parliament, which is the way it's often interpreted. No, rather what it meant was what Americans wanted was only to be taxed by their own colonial legislatures, people for whom they had already voted. Now, I want you to note the irony in this in terms of our current understanding and interpretation of the Boston Tea Party. Everybody today thinks that the Boston Tea Party was a uh, protest against higher taxes. No, it was a protest against lower taxes. It was a protest against lower taxes because that was the idea behind the Tea Act was to lower the tax. Now, so I said that there would be a preface to this talk, and that's in October, um, when the colonists first learned that tea ships were coming under the terms of the Tea Act. Remember, it was passed in May, but it took a while for the East India Company to get itself organized and to send tea over. And so in, in, February, in, in October, the colonists learned that there were tea ships coming. When they learned this, men in Philadelphia and, and uh, New York passed, uh, adopt, wrote essays in the newspapers challenging the East India Company. And they wrote three suggestions as to how Americans could resist the East India Company's tea. One man in Philadelphia suggested persuading, and I put that in air quotes because what he meant was coercing, coercing the merchants to whom the tea was being sent who were known as consignees, they were going to receive all the East India Company tea coming and then would distribute it elsewhere to persuade those men to resign their commissions as consignees. 
And the argument that he made was if the T consignees all resigned their positions, then no T could be sold and so nobody needed to worry. So that was one argument, get the consignees to resign. A second argument was put forward by a New Yorker and he said, no, no, let's not do that. Let's all just sign agreements not to buy or consume East India Company tea. We'll have a general boycott agreement. So that was his argument. But then there was a third argument, also by a Philadelphian, in this case by a man whose name you may know, Benjamin Rush, who was eventually a leader of the revolution in Pennsylvania. He was a doctor, a young doctor at this time. And he argued for preventing the tea from landing in the first place. Now, all three of these tactics were tried in 1773 and thereafter in various locations, because what is not generally known is that East India Company tea kept coming to the colonies throughout 1774. Later on, they were not, the tea was not directly sent by the East India Company. It was ordered by individual merchants, but it was nevertheless sent to the colonies. And so the colonies had throughout the year to think of what their, their responses to the East India Company tea was going to be. Okay, so the response we all know about is the Boston Tea Party. When the landing of the tea was opposed by its destruction from the three ships that made it into the harbor. And that was because there were large meetings in Boston that all agreed that that's what should happen, that they should destroy the tea, or at least that they shouldn't um, complain about the destruction of the tea at the very least. And again, this is ironic because Boston had lagged in its opposition to the tea. Remember, those arguments uh, were coming out of New York and Philadelphia. They were not coming out of Boston. Boston was a latecomer to the opposition to the tea. That's not the way we think of Boston today. Now, Parliament react, retaliated against Boston with the, with the Boston Port Act, which closed the Port of Boston until on June 1st, until the tea was paid for. And people want to talk to me about, ask me questions about that later. I'll be happy to answer it. I'll just say that Boston didn't even find out about that law until the middle of May. So they had all of about two weeks to get ready for a complete closure of their port. But the real issue that I want to talk about today is what happened to those other tea ships, including the one that wrecked on the Cape. Now, it's not widely known. In fact, I didn't know it. I taught the American Revolution for 40 years, but never knew that Charleston was dealing with its tea ship at exactly the same time that Boston was dealing with its three tea ships. Um, now, in chapter one of my book, I tell the stories of Boston and Charleston together, interweaving them chronologically. We go from one week in Boston to one week in Charleston and back and forth. The, the cities did not know what was going on in the other city because the, um, there was too much, um, it, it just took too long for the information to get back and forth, even by sea. Um, by the end of the process, I'm gonna talk about briefly, um, Boston and Charleston each knew that the other tea ship had arrived, but they didn't know very much about what was happening. That is, Charleston didn't know that Boston had destroyed the tea and Boston didn't know what Charleston was doing. So, um, Charleston, in fact, did something very different from what Boston did. Charleston had two, two large meetings, just as Boston did, and had large meetings of residents, but the residents could not decide what to do. Unlike Boston, where people pretty much were agreed, in Charleston, they could not make up their minds what to do. That's why they needed two big meetings. And then, even after the meetings, they couldn't decide what the meetings had decided. There's, con there's confusion everywhere in the newspapers and in the correspondence that I looked at and so forth. So the, what happened in Charleston was that the Carolinians facilitated the confiscation of the tea by customs officers for non-payment of the tea duty. And here I need to say something about what the law said. The, law, the customs law in Britain at the time said that when a ship entered a harbor with a cargo, the, the duty had to be paid on that cargo within 20 days or the cargo would be confiscated. So in this case, that's actually why the Boston Tea Party occurred the night it did on the 16th of December, because the next day was the 17th of December, the 20th day after the ship had entered the harbor, the first ship had entered the harbor. And so the customs officers would have moved, Boston customs officers would have moved to confiscate the tea the next day. Well, in Charleston, that came a couple days later. And um, in this case, the people in Charleston just stood around and watched while the customs officers took this, 
took 300 chests of tea out of the out of the cargo hold of the um, of the ship London, which was the ship in, in Charleston, and stored it all in the basement of the Exchange Building, which was a big mercantile bindet building on the harbor in Charleston. And it's still there. You can visit it and you can see the cellar where this tea was stored after it was confiscated by the customs officers. So then what about Philadelphia and New York? That's Charleston. So Philadelphia actually knew what had happened in Boston by the time the tea ship arrived in Philadelphia. It had to sail up the Delaware to get to Philadelphia. And um, it was a little bit delayed after what it had, what the, the ships that came to Charleston and um, Boston. And by the time it arrived, um, the day before, um, fortuitously, Paul Revere had ridden into town carrying the message from Boston about what had happened. Well, the people in Philadelphia did not want to get into the trouble that the people in Boston got into. So they decided that the best thing to do was to prevent the ship from entering the harbor. Therefore, the 20-day deadline would never apply. So that's what they did. They intercepted the ships from Philadelphia and they persuaded the captain um, not to enter the harbor. Um, uh, the report in the newspaper just sort of they talked to him and they convinced him not to the harbor. I don't know how they Delaware and he sailed back to England. The New York ship was a different story again because the New York ship was blown off course, far off course, by the very same North Atlantic gale wrecked the ship on Cape Cod. It was blown all the way to Antigua and it spent the winter in Antigua, the winter of 1773-74. Of course, that ship captain knew exactly what had happened um, when the, um, uh, exactly what had happened um, because he got the news um, when uh, it, hap it happened in Charleston, Philadelphia and Boston. He didn't want any, anything to do with any of it. So he rode ahead to New York and he said, okay, because of my contract, I have to come to New York, but I'm not gonna try to enter the harbor. I'm just gonna resupply the ship and I'm gonna go right back to, to London. So that's what he did. He, uh, he did not arrive until the end of April, um, but um, everyone welcomed him broadly. They knew he was not gonna do anything. Uh, they knew he was not gonna try to enter the harbor. They knew they were not gonna try to, un to land the tea. And uh, they helped him race by the ship. And at, there's this wonderful thing in newspapers in New York about how all the leaders of the opposition to the tea in New York stood on the, on the wharf at Perth Amboy, New Jersey, which is where he was, waving him goodbye and wishing him a good voyage back to London. Now, the seventh ship is my real topic tonight, and that's the one that wrecked on the Cape. Now, the news of the wreck arrived in Boston on 16 December, the very day the tea on the ships in the harbor was destroyed. The fate of the tea from the William, I think, supplies persuasive evidence that colonial anti-tea organizers chose well when they decided to provide to prevent the EICT from being brought on shore and marketed to colonial customers. It allows historians to consider a short hypothetical question that's usually unanswerable. How would colonists have responded if the East India Company's tea had actually been landed and offered for sale in 1773 and 1774? I argue that what happened on the Cape when the tea arrived could well have been replicated in many other American locales had resistance not succeeded as well as it did. So what happened? let me tell you the story about what happened on the Cape in 1773. 1774. Well, the leaders of Boston assumed that people on the Cape would destroy the tea, um, but that's not what happened. The first official on the scene was a man named Don Greenell, who was a Barnstable County Justice of the Peace based in Wellfleet. And he, a merchant, had business dealings with Richard Clark and Sons, who were the owners of the ship William. <coughs> Greenell was also a personal friend of Jonathan Clark, who was one of the sons of the firm. 
Soon, in the absence of the owners, Greeno supervised the unloading of the cargo by the crew and local workers from the wreck ship. Greeno uh, supervised them, and, uh, he hired them, and they carted the salvaged items to Provincetown. Um, they must have used ox carts. There's no other way they could have done it. It must have been a really difficult job going through those sand dunes on the Cape, away from the Peacot Hill bars, going and taking the items to Provincetown. Um, which included, by the way, things other than tea. It included um, street lamps for the city of Boston that Boston was looking for and medicines and other items that Boston was waiting to get. Now, some of the contents had been damaged, as I already said. Four of the 58 tea chests were damaged, although one of those four was reloaded into a barrel. So basically, there were um, uh, 55 tea chests that were um, salvaged from the wreck and in good enough shape to send up to Boston. Um, he used the tea, that is Greeno, used the tea in one of the other three damaged chests of Bohia to play, pay the workers he had hired. Now I have no idea how many workers he hired. I have no idea um, how much tea was left in that damaged chest, but the, there could have been as much as 300 pounds or 250 pounds of tea in that chest depending on how many workers there were, some workers could have been paid with a lot of tea. So we just don't know. Now, Jonathan Clark then arrived. Clark rode um, um, practically nonstop the 119 miles to Provincetown from Boston as quickly as he could. He and Greeno arranged to have the cargo from the ship that was not tea sent up to uh, Boston um, in local ships from Provincetown. But they found it really hard to find a vessel that would take the tea. Um, there was a captain of a Salem fishing vessel that had sheltered from the storm in Provincetown Harbor, and he agreed to take the 54 chests and one barrel of, equal, of, of um, EICT up to Castle William. This guy, who was from Salem, as I say, he was a fisherman, after he returned to Salem, he was called before the Salem town meeting, and he was asked to explain why he had hired his ship to Clark and Greeno. He defended himself that he did it, quote, through mere inadvertence, quote, and ignorance, end quote. So he said, I, know no I knew nothing. I didn't know what I was doing. It was an inadvertent, um, inadvertent um, um, violation of whatever rules you guys are trying to impose. I, it was nothing to me, I, you know, I just did this ignorantly. He also defended the owner of the ship because the owner of the ship was accused of having sent the ship directly to Provincetown to pick up the tea. And he said, no, no, that didn't happen. It was pure happenstance that the, um, that the ship was there and the owner knew nothing about it. Nevertheless, there were people in Salem, men, who disguised themselves as Indians and went to attack um, to do some kind of attack on the owner of the ship. They, however, discovered to their dismay that the owner of the ship was then being inoculated against smallpox in the local smallpox hospital. And um, therefore, they could have gotten infected with smallpox because inoculation is not vaccination. To be inoculated, you had to be infested with a little bit of the, the live smallpox virus. So anybody who went into the smallpox hospital could have gotten infected with smallpox. So these guys said, no, we're not doing that. And so they went away. And in fact, as far as I can tell, they never did attack the owner of the ship, even when he came out of the smallpox hospital three or four weeks later after he had been inoculated and was now immune. Um, so um, I, have, I don't know whether that was a real, just a total coincidence that he was in the smallpox hospital at the time he was about to be attacked by the locals. But in any event, it was an extremely fortunate thing for him that he was in the smallpox hospital then because it prevented him from being attacked. Okay, so remember one, one um, uh, chest of tea was divided among the workers. Then there were two other chests. And the residents divided into three factions. The residents of the Cape divided into three factions. Men and women who would sell or purchase any tea. Um, those who would sell, earn, or purchase EIC tea from the wreck on which no duty had been paid. And those who opposed the buying and selling of all tea, whether or not it had been taxed or not. 
uh, smuggle tea was not involved on the Cape. This was only EIC legal tea. So you have these different groups of Cape residents who begin then to struggle with each other over what to do with the, the contents of the tea chests. Now, initially, the disputes on the Cape centered on those workmen who had been paid in tea. Some of them, unsurprisingly, sold part of their shares to others, wanting to turn it into cash or to trade it with something else. Well, I don't know how they did it. But in Truro, there were some of these workers from, were from Truro. In Truro, those who ended up with even small amounts of the company tea were brought before the town meeting, just like the Salem ship captain was, and they were forced to acknowledge their error at the town meeting. And during that town meeting, they adopted exactly the same excuse that the Sh Salem captain did. They had acquired the tea, they said, through ignorance and inadvertence, exactly the same phrase. Now, as a part of all of this, an unnamed elderly gentleman, he was written about in the newspapers, <coughs> um, written about in the newspapers, from another town, I have no idea whether it was a town on the Cape or off the Cape or whatever, but he had been in Provincetown and he purchased two or three pounds of tea from one of the workers in Provincetown. And while en route home, back home to wherever he was going, he was accosted in the Wellfleet Woods by three men in disguise. They searched his saddlebags, they found the tea he had purchased and they threw it out along the road. So he lost all of it. Now, near the end of January, 1774, a group of disguised men, and could it have been the same men? I don't know, because I have no idea what the names of these guys were, um, reportedly searched every house in Provincetown looking for tea. And they confiscated whatever tea they found. And now, unless the laborers that Greeno had hired had managed to dispose of the tea they earned before then, they therefore subsequently had very little to show for their effort in salvaging the goods from the wreck. Now, another raid in Provincetown targeted a man named Stephen Atwood, who in early January of 1774 purchased one of the two remaining chests from John Greeno. Toward the end of the month of January, several Loken incendiaries, that's a phrase that Greeno used, confronted Atwood. They searched his house. They found a large quantity of tea in the house and they burned it publicly. Now the raiders might not have located all that Atwood had acquired though, because by then it had been in hands for several weeks, even a month, and he could already have sold part of it. And some months later, a peddler from Martha's Vineyard um, turned up in Lyme, Connecticut with about a hundred pounds of tea to sell people in Lyme, Connecticut concluded that it had probably come from the wreck of the William. Um, and the chest that Greeno turned over to Atwood, which would have had about 300 pounds of tea in it, does indeed seem to have been a likely source for such a large amount of tea. How would a peddler from the vineyard have ended up with 100 pounds of tea if he hadn't gotten it from the wreck of the William and through Atwood? So um, that's one possibility at least, and it brings the vineyard into the story. Now that left one damaged tea chest in the, home, in the custody of John Greeno. And that chest ended up causing even more trouble than the other two. When John was still in Provincetown, his brother David wrote from, Green, wrote from Wellfleet and sent it on a special messenger. It's great that this letter actually survives. His brother David wrote from Wellfleet begging John to have nothing to do with the tea. He, he did not want it reported, he said, quote, that a brother of mine, a son of our honorable father, ever bought or sold any of the detestable stuff, end quote. John's neighbors in Wellfleet, David said, had threatened to destroy not only the tea, but also John's house and his other property. And John was a merchant, so he had a store too. David said, the, your, lo your neighbors will, re will destroy your stuff if you, if you bring the tea here. Um, but, and, and if that happened, David said, nobody will pity you. And he predicted, um, he signed, and I love what he saw, how he signed this letter. He signed your loving brother. If you don't concern with any T end quote, that's how he signed the letter. But John Greeno ignored this well-intentioned warning. 
he sold somewhat more than half of the good tea in the remaining chest of Bohia, about uh, over something over 100 pounds, maybe 150 pounds, to Colonel Willard Knowles, who was one of the leading residents of Eastham. Now, at this time, Wellfleet was a district within Eastham, but the two, the two um, areas operated pretty much independently. Knowles then started to market the tea, and that set off confrontations in both Eastham and Wellfleet between supporters and opponents of these two elite men, of John Green and Willard Knowles. Now, one I think is one of the most interesting things that happened is that the presence of the EICT in Eastham led to competing town meetings and later to standoffs between angry crowds and the local militia. The first town meeting in Eastham occurred on January 21st, 1774. At that time, the town meeting voted to allow Knowles to continue to sell the tea. It had not paid any tax, so why shouldn't he be able to sell it? And they expressed no concern about the sale of the tea. But at the second meeting, a month, late, a month later, a different conclusion was reached. And in February, the meeting was a different meeting. It, it was not restricted to qualified voters. The meeting in January was only for qualified voters. The meeting in February was opened up to all male residents. And at that meeting, um, the, when wealthier men regarded the meeting as irregular and didn't attend, at that meeting, those present excoriated Knowles for buying and selling the tea that it had been obtained from Greeno, and they deliberately insulted him. You remember he was a colonel, he was the leader of the militia, by ordering the selectmen to return or to remove the town's supply of ammunition from his custody. That's a terrible insult, telling the leader of the local militia that he can't be trusted with ammunition with the town's ammunition supply. Now, when the um, selectmen refused to do that, that is, refused to take the ammunition and the guns away from, um, away from um, Knowles, in early March, a disguised crowd threatened one of the selectmen with towering and feathering. But they desisted after he announced that he recognized some of them, which meant that they might be arrested. And so that was the end of that. Um, on two later occasions, crowd, crowds gathered again to try to attack Knowles himself, but the local militia mustered to defend him and the attackers reluctantly ended their campaign. So they quit attacking Knowles, finally. In late March, at a still a third town meeting, Eastham, town, Eastman, Eastham townsmen formally reversed the February vote, declaring that its criticisms of Knowles were, quote, false and scandalous and defamatory. So this is, again, a meeting only open to qualified voters. They insisted that meetings like the one in February would, quote, never have the tendency to restore the liberties of America. Furthermore, they resolved that the buying and selling of untaxed tea should not be interpreted as endorsing the Tea Act or the right of Parliament to tax America. They publicly defended the honor and character of Colonel Knowles. And one of my favorite things of this whole story is that the town meeting of Eastham then ordered the town clerk to, quote, erase, deface, obliterate, and blot out, end quote. They wanted to be known, really sure what was happening erase, deface, obliterate, and blot out the record of the February meeting. They didn't want Knowles to go down as someone who had been, um, had been um, excoriated by the town. And so, having for a second time formally approved the sales of the tea, the residents of Eastham for presumably continued to purchase the salvaged and non-duty paying tea from Willard Knowles. Now, how about John Greeno? Well, he did not have to deal with mobs the way that, Green, uh, that way that Knowles did, but he did have to defend himself verbally against his fellow townsmen. In a formal statement to the other residents of Wellfleet that he drafted in late January, he defended his sale of untaxed EICT and criticized the ruffians, that's his word, who had raided the houses in Provincetown, terming them, quote, plunderers and assassins. Their actions were, quote, as destructive to society as the most cruel tyranny. And he argued if such men gained power, the people of Massachusetts would be worse off than under the current regime. And this is, by the way, the kind of argument that's made frequently in this period by people who oppose what was going on with, mob, with what they regarded as mob rule. They said it's worse 
ruled by them, worse tyranny being ruled by them being, than being ruled by the British. Now, Wellfleet men then voted to place the tea remaining in Greenough's hands, probably about 100 pounds, into the custody of the local committee. Well, they sought advice from Boston. They couldn't decide what to do. And so they wrote to the committee uh, in Boston on the 25th of January to inquire whether tea could be sold in Wellfleet from the damaged tea chest. Then they had to wait for two months for an answer. Boston did not rush to answer to the questions from Wellfleet. Um, and so when the answer came, the Bostonians shifted the responsibility right back to the Cape. They told the inquirers to, quote, rely on your own good sense. So they basically told the people in Wealthy, uh, we're not going to tell you what to do. You just decide yourself. And so they decide this, they did the same thing as Eastham did. They allowed Greeno to market the tea which he proceeded to do despite some persistent opposition from those he termed, quote, factious persons. We don't know exactly what that opposition was, but maybe they were, I don't know, picketing outside his store or something. And he sold all the tea by early May. Now, from this story of what happened in the Cape, on the Cape, where all you guys are so familiar with it, two key conclusions, I think, can be drawn. First, and most obviously, the colonists loved tea, and they were eager to acquire it cheaply. When hundreds of pounds of untaxed tea unexpectedly washed up on their shores, many residents of the Cape proved willing to earn, to, to work to earn it, to purchase it in large or small quantities, and to adopt formal resolutions contending that buying or selling, un, selling unduty tea was a politically neutral activity. Although there were, quote, Cape Indians, as they were called, such as those in Eastham who took a more hardline stance against the purchasers of EICT. They were outnumbered by the Cape Cod residents who were reluctant to give up their favorite beverage. Now, the second point I want to make is the, persuasive, the pervasive dissension. Although residents of the Boston area might have been more or less unanimous um, uh, in wanting to oppose the tea, this was not true even in all Massachusetts towns and in the book I show, it's not true in all other colonies. The debates in Charleston revealed wide ranging disagreements and both New York and Philadelphia chose to exclude the tea ships at least in part because their arrival would have, uh, their arrival would have caused problems just like they, they uh, were causing in, uh, on the Cape and in Charleston. Um, the sorts of conflicts that could arise over tea were vividly illustrated on Cape Cod. Ordinary laborers and sailors were divided between those who would uh, assist in landing or transporting the tea and those who would not. In Provincetown, men in disguise raided their neighbors' houses and attacked travelers on the road, seeking and destroying tea. Eastham residents engaged in competing town meetings, angry crowds, challenged the selectmen and challenged Colonel Knowles, who was the leader of the militia. He was the most elite guy in Eastham. And that was to the dismay of many people. John Greeno's family was divided. Remember, his brother told him not to do it. And his, by the way, his father in Boston also told him not to do it, which I haven't talked about tonight. Um, and Greeno found these circumstances very chaotic and unsettling. Surely other people on the Cape found him the same way. Were towns on the Cape to be ruled by men that, East, that uh, Greeno called Indian Liberty Sons and by a government he termed, quote, the Indian Constitution? That was the question. And by that, of course, he meant um, really a lack of government. Moreover, the ultimate resolution of the disputes in both Eastham and Wellfleet allowing the sale of undutied EICT from the wreck of the William was certainly not a satisfactory outcome from the standpoint of the colonial opponents of the Tea Act. No wonder far-sighted Americans did not want the tea landed. Correctly predicting the possible divisive consequences, they chose the most effective course of action, the one recommended in October by Dr. Benjamin Rush, that is preventing the tea from landing in the first place. And so I'm gonna end this talk there with acknowledging the wisdom of the opponents of the tea in the colonies. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I just need a glass of water for it. Thank you, Dr. Norton. That was great. Um, uh, 
if you've got any questions, and a couple of you have already typed it in, remember uh, to type something in in the chat feature down below, and we'll, we'll use that. Um, I got a couple things right out of the chute. You had mentioned about the Boston Port Act mm -hmm. and how this was essentially protests against lower taxes, which, uh, which right. I, I find mind-numbing. Like yes, um, that's it. Ex explain the Boston Port Act again, and okay. how is this being viewed by it, back in England and by other people that there's protests against lower taxes, which is which I think all of us would probably have a tough time wrapping our heads around. Right. Well, remember what the what the Americans were protesting were the symbolism of the tax, and the what the British were insisting on was the symbolism of the tax. That is, they were insisting that Parliament should be enable enable to, enable to tax America. The Americans were saying, no, Parliament cannot tax America. So the argument was over the tax itself. Even if it was lower, it was still a tax. And that's why the Americans were protesting it. So that's, that's that point. Now, the Boston Port Act, I don't know if that answers your question. You can ask me for more information if you want. Um, the Boston Port Act um, provided that the Port of Boston would be closed to all traffic other than local traffic in food and fuel until the tea was paid for. And Boston was, of course, a major port, had major shipbuilding industries, and um, was very important in the Caribbean trade at the time. And so it really destroyed the economy. The point, the point of the Boston Port Act was to destroy the economy of Boston, which it did as long as the British were there. And of course, the British ultimately um, evacuated Boston in March of 1776. And from that point on, Boston was able to function again. But um, as long as the Boston Port Act was in effect and enforced by the British Navy, which was in force in the uh, Boston Harbor, um, uh, all traffic actually, the British were basically forcing all traffic to come overland um, from uh, Salem. So ships coming from overseas uh, would have to go into Salem uh, enter into the enter the customs house there, pay their duty there, and then any goods that they had uh, that were sh being shipped to Boston um, were had to be carried overland. Um, things could come by land to Boston, for example, people from Connecticut, because they were trying to help Boston um, in this time of trouble. People from Connecticut donated flocks of sheep, which were then driven overland to Boston and so forth. But basically. Boston, the idea of the Port Act was to cut off Boston from um, everything but its hinterland and every, cut off all, all uh, trade, uh, basically kill, the, kill all Boston commerce until the tea was paid for as a punishment for the destruction of the tea. Okay, how much was a pound of, or a chest of tea, uh, a chest of tea worth? Well, I haven't figured the the amount of a particular chest, but the pound, the even or even a pound, but the tea sold for um, about um, East East India Company tea sold for several shillings a pound, sold for about seven seven or eight, let's see seven about seven shillings a pound, and um, smuggled tea sold for about three shillings a pound. So um, you figure it out. And it also depended on how good the tea was. Um, the tea that we're talking about here, the tea that was on the Cape was the basic black tea, Bohia tea. Um, there was nicer tea that was worth more money. And nicer tea tended to be shipped in, um, in chests of only 70 pounds. This ordinary tea was shipped in, t in chests of 350 pounds. But it was basically in today's money, the Bostonians threw hundreds of thousands of dollars of tea into the harbor. They threw 342 chests of tea into the harbor. And most of those were 300, 350 pound chests of tea. So um, okay. hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. You, you talked about uh, uh, a qualified member. What, what does that mean being a qualified, qualified member? Qualified voter. It meant that the person met the uh, the person met the property qualifications for voting in the colony of Massachusetts, and that meant you had to be a man, um, you had to own a certain amount of property, and I cannot tell you what that amount of property was in the towns on the Cape, 
there was a, uh, a minimal, you could not vote unless you were, um, in other words, a man of substance. You couldn't vote if you were a young guy. It was not, it was not a vote based on age. It was a vote based on you being regarded as a man of substance in the community. So um, you had to have a, a, a freehold of, the, of, an, of particular assessed value based on the last tax assessment to be a qualified voter. Um, with the destruction of the tea, what, how does this impact smugglers? What's, what's the smuggled tea rise in price? And um, Well, it's hard to know what happened in Boston. Um, uh, Boston seems to have actually, uh, crazily enough, Boston seems to have been more likely to buy EIC tea than smuggled tea before all this happened. Um, Philadelphia and New York, we know, had very little um, legitimate um, importations of EICT in the years before 1773. Um, they, it's been estimated that those cities were both drinking well over 150,000 pounds of tea a year. <laughs> Everybody drank tea. It's kind of like coffee today. It's definitely like coffee today. Um, the people were, people were drinking so much smuggled tea, but in New York and Philadelphia, only a couple of hundred chests of, or only a couple of hundred pounds of tea got officially entered into the customs um, system and paid duty on. So basically, hundreds of thousands of pounds of smuggled tea were being sold um, in the colonies. Um, in Boston, it's really hard to know, um, but clearly there was smuggled tea out there. There was plenty of it. Um, I have not studied this, but a man I know who is a who teaches at, at the University of Hong Kong, James Victor, people really interested in this topic. He's doing a book specifically on the tea trade, and he has done things like read all the newspapers of this period, looking for ads for tea to be sold, and so he knows how many merchants there were selling the tea. Now, we don't know how many pounds of tea each of those merchants were selling, but he knows that there were tens of merchants in every community selling tea. And most of that tea would have been smuggled. So um, I don't, it's so hard to find out how much the cost of the smuggled tea was. It just isn't, um, it just isn't anything. So anyway, that's, it's just impossible to know. It's impossible to know. If, if you're part of the great unwashed, like, oh, I don't know, yeah. me, who doesn't right. drink tea, um, EIC tea, what, is one more bitter than the other? What, what is, well, there the was a big argument about which tea was better. I mean, some people said that EIC tea was better than the Dutch tea, and other people said, no, the Dutch tea was better. I mean, who knows? Uh, as I said, the EIC had a whole variety of, of, of uh, grades of tea. And um, so they sent, sometimes they sent better tea to America and sometimes they sent worse tea to America. And it was all, I mean, it's all a matter of taste and, and substance, you know, of whether you like the taste of this tea or that tea. And people did argue over whether the Dutch tea, the smuggled tea was better than the English tea, regardless of whether it was, whether it was um, um, smuggled or not. Um, so I don't, we cannot really judge what's better at this, at this distance. We just know that everybody drank tea and lots of it. Of the uh, towns you mentioned on the Cape, on the, on the, okay. those are lower Cape towns. What, what are we talking about in population at that time? They're in the like, hundreds. You know? All right. Um, I know your book basically uh, you, you start with the with, with the tea. You kind of end. It kind of leads into Lexington and Concord. Tell us a little bit more about the. Well, about the, the whole, whole book, book is um, what I do is I trace what happens throughout the year, um, as the as news passes from one place to another. I follow the stories in the newspapers and see how different towns react, or different cities and different areas. Not all towns and cities. So for example, the Virginia countryside react to the news um, about what's going on in the other places, you know, how Boston reacts to Charleston, how Charleston reacts to Boston and so forth. Um, and I deal with how the colonies in general dealt with um, 
um, dealt with the, um, the fact that um, the British were being very recalcitrant. That is, there were a number of Americans who kept wanting the British to adopt conciliatory policies, and instead the British kept adopting harder line policies, um, which ultimately forced a lot of Americans who were originally in favor of reconciliation to support resistance. Um, and what I talk about in the book is what happens throughout the year as, for example, um, throughout the summer of 1774, in the wake of the Boston Port Act, in the wake of the other coercive acts, um, which are also adopted by Parliament in the spring of 74, how people react to those. And let me just give you one example, an act that, that does not get a lot of attention. It's called the Administration of Justice Act, officially. And what it provided in, in some was that if a British colonial official or military officer was charged with killing an American um, in a disturbance, that person could be tried in England rather than in America. So if it had been operative in 1770, it would have moved the Boston massacre trial to out of Boston and to, um, to London. Um, the Americans called that the Murder Act which to me is very telling. And even future loyalists were very distressed by this law because they said, this means we have no way of striking back against a vicious military man or colonial official who shoots people or who rapes our, our wives, because these are all men who say this, or who rapes our wives and daughters. We have no way of, um, of trying them for their crime. So that aroused a lot of opposition. And throughout the colonies in the summer of 1774, the colonists held local meetings. And I talk about those at some detail. We don't really know what happened at them, but they did adopt resolutions. And uh, we don't know the minutes of those meetings, but we do know that they adopted resolutions. And the resolutions basically supported Boston offered financial support to Boston, did not always support, in fact, did not usually support the Boston's destruction of the tea, but they supported the Boston against the strictures of the Port Act, and they elected representatives to the First Continental Congress, which then met in Philadelphia in September and October of 1774 and plotted a unified um, resistance to Britain. That's basically what the book is about, how that happened. It's, the book is a study of political discourse, I say. It's a way, the way that Americans in correspondence, pamphlets, and newspapers talked about the political crisis that they found themselves in. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us tonight and spending some time um, uh, uh, even though you're not too far away I'm in the vineyard, uh, I think everyone's a little uh, everyone's a little bit far away right these days. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, sure. uh, thank you for touching on uh, a, a local history, even though it's part of a, a, a broader national history. Um, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I want to thank um, you, Dr. Norton. Um, our next talk is on Thursday night. Um, so. Again, great good luck with this book, and um, thanks for joining everybody us. Everybody go out and buy the book and find out the rest of the story. <laughs> All, right. All right, stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm.